Alright, hey Twitch, uh, you thought my channel ended its content a while back, and we kind of did, but we're starting up some new stuff lately. Um, I th if you've been around the block for a bit, you know we streamed a little bit of Stars Without Number um, with our very own Jimmy at the helm of the Space Master, and we're diving back into that for a little bit with a brand new cast, brand new setting, and um, yeah, it should be fun. So we'll do a quick little introduction to people, and then uh, we'll... Get, let Jimmy take it away. So, um, some of the cast we got here is uh, Apache playing Atlas. Uh, we got Dart playing Maximus. We got Jason playing Varlo, and got myself playing Selfie. And um, again, Jimmy is our Space Master, and um, this is actually session ten. We've been playing a little behind the scenes, and I think Jimmy got a little uh, catch up for you guys to uh, to hear. So, Jimmy, uh, take it away. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome you guys. We don't talk about it enough, but we are playing in uh, the sector called Tartarus Beta, designated by the Terran Mandate. Um, in a, a campaign I guess I've called the Dust of the Old Guard. The remains of the Terran expansion across the universe uh, as it receded after the scream and the great cataclysm. Uh, there is much to discover throughout this sector, and that's been kind of the party's focus. Um, party has got together um, somewhat on a whim uh, from a very good uh, contract offer from a powerful mega corporation called Outer Tech Unlimited. Um, noted space port and a starship builder of this sector. Um, and controls much of the production of the most advanced technology in space, um, recruited them for some uh, a contract work that involved uh, uh, sort of cleaning up a mess of theirs on a backworld uh, mining colony that they oversee, if not totally control. Um, suffice to say that they learned much on there, including learning the existence of and, and discovering a hidden ship um, which they have dubbed the Vanderhorn, um, that was hidden away by another corporation, the High Beam Union, that we don't know much about yet, but we've successfully, or the party has, uh, obtained a ship, um, set out uh, into the universe, uh, to the sector that there is to explore to make their way. They're only... Uh, the only things holding them back are the uh, the needs of the ship itself and the needs of the crew members. Um, they've conducted some various uh, projects trying to earn some credits and capital to be able to maintain the ship itself, and they all have some big goals in mind. Why don't I turn it over to you guys? Tell us a little bit about, like, maybe in, like, just two or three sentences about your, your character, because we have some interesting characters um, who are manning the the uh, the starship Vanderhorn, uh, and we're gonna start with our host, uh, Selfie. All Tell right. Tell us about Selfie. Uh, Selfie is. Let's see. How old did I put him down? Uh, I think he was older gentleman of age fifty two. Um, he's a male human. Um, he's been a soldier most of his adult life. Uh, from mercenaries across ships to just uh, I guess taking care of his own and himself. Um, and he's been kind of uh, ship hopping for most of his life, just getting the odd job here and there. Um, you know, security postings, and uh, I don't know. I guess his, his pride and joy is his little uh, uh, lightning dagger, sword, whip weapon that he likes to uh, use on uh, unsuspecting people. Yeah, you have a powered whip as yeah. your weapon. Yeah, it's pretty great. Selfie's a big fan of it. Um, and I don't know. Sometimes he's uh. On the ship, I think he may maybe keeps to himself a little bit. Even he has some friends, but uh, when he's in tactical situations, he likes to uh, take charge and offer his advice. Nice. Uh, Maximus, also similarly martially minded. Tell us about Maximus. Maximus is uh, age 38. He's a warrior. Comes from an impoverished youth. Uh, he's very driven to unify through force or other means to bring things together through the chaos. Um, so he has a very uh, order-minded, uh, I guess, general outlook on life. Um, it's an ideology he found in his adulthood as he joined a military force. I don't remember the name of that um, main planet, Jimmy. 
it's like Jerusalem, like New Jerusalem or something. Yeah, the the it's a the megalopolis of this sector. The city which populates the whole planet is called New Jerusalem. On the the planet, which nobody refers to it, but is called Almasari. But yeah. yeah, you you came you came up through the ranks of the uh, the militia essentially uh, that mm-hmm. the government sponsored on New Jerusalem. Yeah. I think a lot of us came from from that planet, uh, or at least me and Varla both did. Uh, but yeah, so Maximus, uh, he's kind of has a shifting southern accent, <laughs> depending on how <laughs> I'm playing him that day. Uh, but he's a bit of a fast talker, which we found out pretty early on in the game. So yeah. That's something we needed. Uh, so he's a character that's evolving as we play, but he smokes a lot of cigarettes. Uh, he's got kind of a skewed view on things, and to justify the means, the sector is a very large place. And uh, a few hicks and bumps along the way doesn't uh, necessarily... Um, make him stop believing in his ideology. If anything, it just makes him more firm that it's the right thing to do. Um, he's a sharpshooter and uh, general carouser. And, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. necessarily think he's the leader or anything, but uh, he certainly ends up talking the party into some interesting situations. <laughs> or perhaps out of them. Uh, yeah, maybe the- corralling some of the uh, larger personalities. And uh, going back to Selfie real quick, you, you're definitely the prototypical spacer, it sounds like. Yeah. You're the guy who's just made his way opportunistically, and that's been a good life for you. Yeah, like, yeah, it has. Uh, let's bump down to Varlo. Tell us about the uh, the twitchy Varlo. So- Varlo Dine. I think if we were going to describe Varlo in a word, uh, in a word, it would be a mess. Varlo is a, I guess, a mad scientist in that for him life is cheap, especially if it pursue, like if it gets him what he wants, which is usually knowledge or an experiment of some kind which furthers his goals, and he is willing to get everyone else's hands dirty to get whatever he wants out of a situation. Though rarely his own, um, he, he's quick to push other people into the fire or manipulate situations so that bad things are just happening around him and he can just kind of observe and, and try to keep himself out of danger because at the end of the day, Varlo is very much a coward. <laughs> I like that. Um, Varlo has the distinction in our earliest sessions of uh, being incredibly nimble with his mind and his hands and being able to both fashion bombs um, out of uh, nails and paper clips and leftover <laughs> fuel reserves, um, but also to uh, being somewhat of a collector. You have various robotic parts that you've spent probably too much money on to uh, bring onto the ship, as well as um, occasionally figuring out a way with the help of some friends of uh, downloading an ancient pre-tech archive, or at least part of it, uh, psychically into your mind, not knowing how it would work, but knowing that if you just make make space in your mind, you can you can accomplish, you can tackle worlds. I'm just hoarding. I'm collecting all the good stuff now, and eventually I'll understand how to use it. But for now, just give me the goods. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think both the most stable in some ways, but also the most interesting member of this crew. Uh, most exotic. Atlas. Yeah, introduce yourself. Uh, Atlas is a giant moth person, the the race Lepidomo. Um, he comes from a line of mythalistic uh, moths that sort of are hyper psionically inclined. All, all their entirety of their race is uh, psionically inclined, and uh, after the the scream is what it's called, right, Jimmy? Yeah. After the scream, um, his uh, the majority of his race was um, enslaved by what was left of humanity, and uh, he was recently freed by a an offsect of his uh, of his race because you have the sourceful, which are very optimistic while, while also you know very um, grounded in reality. And then you have the source lists, which are very much like, well, nothing matters, so I can do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you are of the source full or the source less, remind uh, us. He, he's a source full. Yeah. And so for for our audience, um, the, the Lepidomo are kind of a hive mind. 
Uh, they are psionically gifted um, inherently as a part of their species. It is different oftentimes uh, in the way that humans have come into that ability in this um, in this timeline of, of Earth and humanity. Um, and that presents some challenges at times. Um, it also um, raises a lot of questions because there is a split between kind of the hive mind of the what what types of what you do and don't do changes depending on the type. And there are a significant number of still enslaved uh, Lepidomo at a an undisclosed location that Atlas hasn't uh, really had to talk about yet or to address. Um, he, he doesn't talk about it unless you, you want he, other people want to talk about it. It's it's fine. And nobody wants to talk about the fucking yeah. Lepis, so Yeah, exactly. So I mean it's whatever. But uh, yeah, uh, oddly kind-hearted. I would say Varlo uh, always experimenting. So there's a lot of good dynamics in the party. But to bring you guys back, and I'm going to pull you guys in to, to fill in the gaps a little bit, because I'm just going to do what you were setting out to do, which was you had made your way off of the planet to Thoris and the uh, city of um, cyber communists of some sort basically a a commune of managed by precogs who sort of foresaw all the needs of the society and made a sort of semi-perfect utopia that was falling apart when you got there and you succeeded in ensuring that it it truly fell apart at least in some degree you wonder as you left how much of it was planned your arrival and your involvement and how much was truly outside of the script um, but you left with some valuable, valuable artifacts, many of which you don't actually know the usage of, um, which we'll probably preview at some point in this episode. You um, had a quarry that you owed to your patron, uh, the project manager of the Special Projects Division of Outer Tech by the name of Tabitha Gladstone. Yes. Um, you were trying to figure out a way to deliver the goods to her um, uh, trying to get paid as much as possible, acknowledging that you couldn't deliver the full goods because you couldn't bring out the original archive. You could only bring out what was able to be preserved in Varlow's mind. Um, and that worked out ultimately when you did meet up uh, to some 28,000 credits out of a possible, like, almost 100,000 payout, basically. Uh, you were directed to the planet... Uh, Raghad or Raghad I don't know how to say it, it's fine uh, it's the home system of Outer Text where their, their base of operations is uh, in the, the system Astioc which is in the 3-3 three, three hex where your little ship token is positioned now in roll 20 um, there's two habited planets there one is Thucydides, that's the home planet of Outer Tech. that's where their main starport is and their uh, the dry dock for producing ships, everything. It is a planet that is cloaked in darkness because the star of this system is uh, dying, nearly dead, and a planet that was once once habitable um, for whatever reason had a reason to have a starport built into it and, you know, ship construction and, and docking and, and uh, life support built in is now left kind of in darkness. Or maybe it's always been in darkness. Who knows why it's there? Uh, on the other side, there's the planet of uh, Raghad, which is uh, very close to the dying star. Shows evidence of having once been a maybe um, populated and um, temperate planet is now a blasted wasteland of desert and rock. Um, Where rough warlords, crime lords, and other thugs reside... Um, and you guys uh, were informed that this is a planet that they kind of outer tech maintains and helps support different communities of thugs and toughs if they ever need them. They're kind of stationed on this planet to do various work. And Tabitha Gladstone, your patron, um, arranged to meet you there to receive your archive. Uh, you went down to the planet. Um, you had some words with uh, some of the toughs at the, the station that you were scheduled to meet at. Uh, it seems the tensions were kind of high, but that they stayed in line in terms of not, you know, doing more than providing the security that they're supposed to. 
And, uh, yeah, you met Tabitha Gladstone's, um, not doppelganger, but her stand-in, which is <laughs> her seemingly endless number of X2 droids, these, like, human-like but featureless droids that speak through Tabitha's voice that often behind on some sort of view screen you can see at some undisclosed location that she is neurotic, uh, neurologically connected to some sort of system and able to project her consciousness out. Um, anyway, you made the exchange, you made your bargaining, you did the best you could. I thought you guys did a good job. Um, no sparks flared, there were no fights. You got paid and you download the information. Is there anything else that happened in that last session that you want to uh, talk about? Uh, I mean, the, the elephant in the room, Jimmy. We, we turned a little child into a scion. <laughs> they yes. want to do a lot worse, too. <laughs> oh, I, and it's I true. Mean, I failed to mention there are some other crew members on the Vanderhorn. Yeah, we got, we got three uh, crew other members, right? There's yeah. Jorans, um, who is a, a, a cargo loader and a sort of street tough inspired enough by selfies promises of uh, payout that he's a, a worker on the on the ship um, selfie has a in the rules has a, a certain um, ability that allows him, uh, allows him to acquire hench keep henchmen basically your hench keeper trait and uh, so Jorns is the guy you've picked up along your travels, who's just kind of there helping. Can't do much in terms of fighting, but it sure is useful in terms of, you know, getting the cargo in and out. Yeah. Um, you also happen to find an old friend of yours, Selfie, um, by the name of Carmela Soto. Yeah. An endless, endlessly positive, uh, live and let live uh, pilot um, by trade, who has served... Um, with Selfie in the past on various ships and, and ventures that they had. Uh, copy image. Oh, yeah, you're, there we go. There. It's on. It's, I put a bigger image on briefly on uh, Roll20. Okay. Carmela is a spacer by trade. Um, she was stuck somewhere. Some customs issue. She was trying to pull some shit. Um, and the party bailed her out basically, and in return, she's piling the ship for them, uh, the ship for them, and is expecting to get paid at some point, but definitely a friend. And third, in our earlier session, um, Atlas picked up in the remains of a mining camp, basically a mining enclave. Uh, there had been some sort of violent outbreak, and a child of ten by the name of Adair had um, been scooped up, basically. Um, brought onto your ship because he had nowhere else to be and is sort of a refugee but uh, a ward of the party. Um, he was asked, as he's beginning to thaw into his role, he was asked, what? What did you guys want to do with him? I wanted to turn him into a human hard drive, but, <laughs> I mean, we no, we that. can't experiment on the child, we I guess. That. I mean, you vetoed it, but the child... Still went through with the procedure. <laughs> Not to be a hard drive. I mean, I... so so in mechanics, what did, middle, what did you guys do? Ground. What yeah. did you guys do? You so so Varlo had the the portion of the archive that he could hold, and there was concerns about well, is he just going to get kidnapped? Right? We need a a copy. Yeah. We need the information duplicated. So what did you do? We attempted initially to have the child inherit my copy of the information so that we could just give the child to the company and then we Outer decided that, yes. that yes um that's probably not an ethical thing to do and some of our party were opposed in trading in children's lives so instead we copied the information to his brain in an attempt to preserve it in case they took it out of my brain at which point we turned him into some kind of scion you know, just so we we don't really gone. it was we the side really, effect, right? So well, we don't really know yet. Off, some people backed off on their whole. Oh yeah, this kid's expendable. When it's like, oh wait, they're psionic. Oh, suddenly they matter now. Uh, <laughs> well, now he's useful. Which yeah, now he's it? useful. What? I don't I don't understand what you're oh, talking about. Sorry. So this is exactly what the actually... reason why Atlas brought him on. Okay, not taking this... sides, but what actually happened is. That... <laughs> 
Adair, uh, age 10, around 10, you don't really know, um, give, being given a, 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 an archive of information that was in itself um, psionically constructed, it's controlled in the past. Presumably someone had the, either the training or the equipment to be able to manipulate it, to be able to read their journal, take notes or their, their archive of information and be able to manipulate it psychically. We don't have that or it was damaged or whatever happened to it um, in the past. Um, but what you did have was the information itself and you dumped it into what you had into Adair's mind and found that it took the information's preserved there. Who knows if he can like think about it or recall it because he is a, a young malleable mind. But because he had a young malleable mind, it also, um, because of your like critting all these roles, um, didn't immediately kill him or put him into a, a brain coma, but found out that he actually what had latent psychic abilities. He was somebody who in something like three to six or seven years probably would have shown the signs of being um, uh, of having MES, the, the condition in humans anyway, that is associated with becoming a psychic if you can become trained. An untrained MES, MES is itself an illness, a brain illness that will kill and waste away the body either through madness or decomposition or just outright death. Um, he showed that ability in a, a stunning telekinetic display that threw somebody across the room and some sort of explosion or you know exploding vials in the in the the medical bay but Adair uh yeah seems to be psychic you definitely have activated in him his abilities and it activated them earlier than not intended but that they would have manifested call it like if you're entering puberty, if one day you woke up and your beard was a foot long and you didn't know what to do with your penis anymore, like, or we can go a different direction in it, but like, like, yeah, it's, it's essentially like being thrust way ahead of your time in terms of what your body and your mind can handle. Um, so that's what's going on with the dare. Now he's okay. He, he survived the process because of ridiculous roles that you guys made. Fuck your roles. Um, <laughs> but you have a longer term problem now, which is that he is on a timeline now that every human born with MES or shows MES symptoms has to either find a way to cope with those abilities to either be able to handle them so they don't drive them mad, kill them, or to be able to train and, and become a psychic which is a different, or, or is the next step. Um, to that end, Atlas put a word in to the, the sort of um, security officer who appeared to be a psychic or was a psychic at the, um, at the meeting you had with Tabitha's dro droid uh, in this planet, and she said that she would, she nodded and said that she would help you figure out a way to train him. And that's where we start with the party after a very long recap, but that was actually kind of uh, cathartic to get out. Um, here you guys are. You look outside a, a view screen. You can't open any windows here. There's a sandstorm outside on the planet Rikad. It's pretty constant. Where there's an hour without um, wind, there'll be two with. Um, there's no vegetation to speak of. It's too hot to be outside without at least uh, some protection. You don't need vac suits per se. Um, the ecosystem has long failed. Um, whatever is here is based on infrastructure that had already existed to be able to let uh, human habitation ex like work. You've got a crew of, I think I said like it's three or four locals. I gave one of them a name, I don't remember it. It's probably like Bob or Fred or something like that, but you've got some locals. You don't remember their names. Um, they look at you tensely. You've got your ship waiting. You've just been paid. You've just heard back from uh, this agent. Uh, 143 is how she gave her de designation. Um, that she would look into some information from you. But you're for now, you have some time 
uh, in this facility to decide what you do next. The the, the locals actually, after um, the outer tech um, security officer leaves, um, stay for a moment and look around. Um, they pull up a what looks like kind of like a two-way radio, but there, there's some hushed conversation. And they seem to pile out a, a different exit presumably that leads um to a tunnel system or something and in fact you see some speeders like go away so you have this bunker in the desert with nothing around you to yourselves at the moment what do you do we were heading back to our ship right like our business here is done yeah, your business is done. I want to give you, if you wanted it, time on this, just like right here in this room right now to, to talk about anything. If you wanted to talk about it on your ship, then we could just... Oh, okay. Like you're up in orbit. I'm just... You have some time right now. In this bunker, I, I, I wanted actually Carmella, Jorans, Adair to be, because they're out of the... They're in the ship itself, which is... Yeah, uh, just uh, the party's here right now. Okay. Just the party's here right now. Okay. So do, What's your plan? Do we, yeah, what's... We got paid. Was um, there any would... mention of continual work? It's not there's a, there's a yeah. There's always uh, the possibility with Tabitha, but you didn't hear anything immediately. Okay. Well, right, right now. Uh, well, we got a nice sum of change in our pockets. Why don't we uh, head back to an actual place that's fucking habitable and go get our lab repaired? Yes, uh, I would posit that that would be. The next optimal uh, maneuver. I would like to get my lab working again soon. Kind of like look over my shoulder at the locals. See you later. Fuck your shithole planet. Yeah, they're walking out the back the back hallway, and one of them gives you the finger as he. <laughs> Probably the same guy I've been like blowing smoke in the face of the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> they don't engage. It seems whatever they're paid for uh, was paid good enough to not um, start shit. <laughs> Nice. So. Fuck you too. <laughs> that's that's Maximus' contribution. Cool. Yeah. So I think unless you guys got something, we do more conversing as we leave the planet. So you um, you you suit up. It's just mainly like uh, face masks and uh, covering your your nose. And, and what not to prevent the dust. And you've got a good sensor and, and Carmela's on the um on the on your like earpieces basically saying like Yep, yeah, that's right guys. Nope, nope, no no no. That's that's gonna take you who don't go that way. Come on. No, like like thirty degrees to the left. Okay. Just straight ahead. That's Farlow, that's not straight. And she's like guiding you back to the ship. Um you guys pile on. Um you check in um, Atlas. You pop into the med bay um, where Adair had um, been in and out of consciousness. Um, he's conscious right now. He's running a high fever. Um, it seems to be better from the last time you saw him. Um, mm, okay. Uh, you check his fluids. He's good to go. Like He's, he's okay right now, but you may be... Or in the med bay. Um, where are you guys going? You meet uh, up in the command center. Yeah. Wasn't it part of the deal? We had access to a uh, at cost. Um, what was it like? Engine engineering part or, or, or some sort of like chop shop? I don't remember. Yeah. No. no yeah. No. You're right. That's uh, what Varlo was saying. We should do next. Um, yeah. You had gotten essentially a docking standard docking number. Nothing special. Yeah. The ability to dock at uh, the planet Thucydides and to uh, hire out an outer tech um, engineering arm, computer tech arm, basically, um, to pay them to repair uh, the virtual intelligence or whatever else you want to. you, you got to repair stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, Atlas would give uh, Adair a shot of iron because children are always low on iron. And then, <laughs> and then he would uh, proceed over to the, I guess to the main na main bridge and be like, "So are we heading out?" Well, yeah. I'll I'll take the ship 
where the fuck we're going, but where the fuck are we going? Um, I believe our deal next brings us to uh, Thucydides is the the location. Yeah. Shit, we get to see the city at night? Oh, I got, I got my eye on... Okay, so so there's these these engines. They, they're supposed to... They don't, they don't do shit when you're up in orbit, whatever. But when you get down in the atmosphere, they can get you down from... Okay. I think Barlow's already, like, turned his back to her and is pulling up readings and just ignoring it. I'm just it. saying that, they're, that the top-notch people who know their... You know, the top gearheads, they work at Thucydides. I doubt that. I'm on this ship, and I don't think that they are more educated or more specialized than myself. I mean, really. <laughs> she just wide-eyed blinks at you. Yeah. All right, then. Off we go. Um, okay. Uh, I guess this docking number is good. Selfie we, we good? Yep. We got we got clearances, too, from Outer Tech to use some of their uh, repair shops at, at cost, so... Good. Because they'll bilk you if you don't have it at cost anyway. You don't have yeah. any of those discount coupons, do you? <laughs> and she, and she like, turns and is like... Fucking mad cackle. Yeah. <laughs> She's about to press the, like, go, and the ship's just sort of waiting. And she's like, yeah, paid, right? We got paid? Yeah, we got we paid. We got paid. Not, we... not as much as we wanted, but we got paid. We got paid, right? There was a payment. It was received. Uh, when she says that, Atlas sends over to, like, to her screen the amount of debt that she has accrued <laughs> and the amount that she's just paid off. <laughs> She looks at that and smiles and says, How good has your sleep been in Spike Space, baby? <laughs> Come on, Mothman. How good have my jumps been? No, no, no. She comes up and she like actually like strokes oh, one of your um like mandible antennas, like kind of like sort of how good has it been to actually sleep when you're in metadimensional space? Uh I think there's like a telekinetic like she gets lifted off the air and pushed like 15 feet away. <laughs> all right, all right. Maybe the wrong, the wrong antenna. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just saying. You got me off the planet. That's good. That's good. Uh, I want to stay on this crew, so I'm just. She. she I, sort I'm of... happy. I'm made. I'm made for life. Selfie. <laughs> tell them I'm made. Tell them I'm made. I've got I, my bank accounts. Like, yeah. Come did, on. Did you did you get a small fortune after we parted ways? I, okay, I did, and I invested some of it in our the failed venture, um, you know, uh, Pasa Dos. But that's that's beside the point. I'm saying that you didn't buy that cryptocurrency, did you? We talked about this. I, I cold hard. I, Honey, it's credits. It's all cryptocurrency. <laughs> I'm not the I'm not the crew. That's hauling around freaking ionite in there, like raw ionite, thinking that's going to be something like research anyway. purposes. Re research purposes. I understand. Trading purposes got me off that planet. I respect that. That's good. I'm just saying, I'm in here. I want to be in for the long haul, and I can be happy anywhere. I want to be happy with you, Selfie. And I want to be happy with you, Atlas. And you. Maximus and uh, anyway, I want to be happy, and you know the best way to make a good pilot happy, make sure they're well compensated. Yes, look, it. This is the first job you came in the middle of the job. We'll we'll talk uh, specifics next job. You'll have a seat at the table up front. All right, I trust you, selfie. I trust you. You know I'm good for it. Just like I know you're good not to collide us in the middle of a planet through Spike Space. All right. Ah, that's right. All right. I'll delete that uh, end of the uh, tracking. Anyway, um, <laughs> shall we? Off to all the... Oh, shit. We're just going to the cities. Man, let's just like a autopilot. And she like presses the button. It's like, I'm going to take a nap. And because, yeah, <laughs> like you're just going from one end of the system to the other. Take you about 36 hours. Sure. Um, do you guys want to have any conversations in between? Uh, 
Um. I don't. Good. <laughs> nice. Um. Yeah, I think um. After about three or four hours, uh, Adair's fever breaks, and he wakes up. Does he have gout? <laughs> no, he doesn't have gout. Okay. I feel like Varlo would suggest just to keep him sedated until we have any news on like how to rein in his power. Okay. Just so, put him in a coma. Just so so him, Adair wakes down. up and he hears above him. There's Varlo and who else is in the room? Uh, probably Atlas. Yeah, he he's uh, groggily coming too. And um, Atlas, you know this because you can sense when a person is in the room conscious or not. Like you get a yeah. Um, you can sense he's kind of conscious, so have this conversation. Yeah, Varla, what, what, what were you saying, like, halfway through before he wakes up? Um, perhaps if we induce a uh, coma to his system, and then inject several different strands of adrenals, it might help his body to absorb the changes and bolster his power, thereby creating some kind of new metapsionic. Uh, <laughs> I think, like, you hear in your head... <laughs> I don't think that that's going to work. And who's to say he's not going to subconsciously just pour himself out of the ship if he's not conscious? Is that something your powers are capable? Interesting. I wonder what that would affect on a child's body. <laughs> you mean the, the cold outside of space on a child's yes. body? You could... Farley, you should Atlas... find out. It's a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> Atlas sort of like looks to you perplexed and just like well a valid experiment I don't want to subject this child to that of course no it would be a waste of resources but interesting all this scene at any rate what about if we mate him with several of your own species and try to inbreed the power Atlas like looks to you and just like doesn't say anything in your head. You just hear like a like like a like a just like a hum in your head. <laughs> Atlas. Atlas. It's like the sound of crickets. Yeah. Um Atlas. Oh. Yeah. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get sick. Oh. I'm sorry. And he, and he like is like wiping um sweat and sits up. It's like I'll get back to work. Um I think I was working on some, some, something. I don't know. Um, yeah. Training. Training. Yeah. Atlas sort of is like, Shh, uh, th your training now is to rest and watch this movie. And it's like a shitty YouTube video on how, like, how to deal with M <laughs> um, MES. <laughs> he like looks at his like, and is captivated for a minute or two. And he's like, I've never seen anything like this. And then begins to focus on the content a bit. And he says, am I sick, Atlas? And he, like, boops it off. Yeah, I think Atlas sort of looks and says, some would consider it a sickness, but others can use what you have to do great things. It's how I talk to you in your head. It's how I lift things without using my body. This... This is... Because of... The... Surgery I had, right? You're welcome. And I kind of go slap on the shoulder. Yeah, Atlas sort of looks... Uh, like... Shakes his head and says... Um, no, this is this has been expedited by the um, download of information, but you have had the surgery, so surgery. Uh, well, psychic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> it's not experiment. Yeah, yeah. psychic experiment. Yeah, that at least not psychic experiment. I have, I have the. The hallucinating sickness? That's what we called it. Uh yes. <laughs> like Atlas sort of shrugs. 
Yeah, he he Adair sinks back into his pillows. He's... I explained to Aunt Clara, I guess. <sighs> what happened to Aunt Clara? She uh, went went pretty crazy, and um, tried to burrow her way through the wall with her bare hands. We found her when her um, hands were down to um, stumps, trying to dig. Sorry. Mm. Uh, it's something we know about. A couple people, maybe one or two in the surrounding enclaves get sick with the hallucinating sickness. There's a lot of bad air down in the mines. Just thought it was part of that. Well, it's it's not bad air. It's genetic. You're genetically different than the normal humans. You're psionic inclined, and and I think like he spews like information into his head, uh, like about like how psionics works and what it means to some extent. Um, yeah, he, he's like, he takes that and goes like that. And, but then, um, you can see him immediately pale and break out into a sweat, like beads of sweat appear on him. Um, nothing seems to happen. Um, but he looks confused for a minute, um, and sort of gasps, um, and then shakes his head said, I'm sorry, what, what happened? Uh, did you did you get the information? I would what information? I I was just asking talking about Aunt Clara. Okay, you, okay. And, and I think at that point Atlas just sort of like slowly nudges him down into in, into the thing and he says, Don't worry, I'm just doing some tests and I'm giving you a shot and he just gives him some uh something to to make him sleep. And he's just like, don't worry, we'll figure this out eventually. I it's, told uh, you a coma would be a good alcohol. I'm, and, and like in your head, in your head, he's just like, I'll put you in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's nodding. Says, I still don't feel very. So I guess I should rest some. And it's like his his active or conscious brain activity sort of ceases. So yeah, and I, at that point, uh, Atlas. Did he get a message back from uh, that agent yet, or no? Um, yeah, so that's actually a good uh, point to review uh, after our break, I think. Okay. Ooh, yes. All right, we guess we're doing a break, guys. See you we're later. Doing a, doing a break, Kevin. Yes, we are. Give me five seconds. <laughs> we're trapped here! <laughs> oh, God. I can't um, get out of my seat. All right. We're, Kevin, we're no. good for a break. We're good for a break. Oh, okay, <laughs> we're good for a break. I could have totally uh, done something with Maximus, but that's fine. Give us, give us a break. I have a draft break screen, so no judges. Okay, guys, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back in about five, seven minutes. Um, thanks for watching.